Hello, I'm Roger Baker. I'm here with Paul Floyd, one of our military analysts here at Stratfor. Uh, a few weeks ago, we discussed some of the politics behind the situation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, today, we're going to discuss a little bit more about the military aspects of what's going on. Paul, uh, as we look at the North Korean actions, missile launches and tests, um, artillery drills, things of that sort, there's a lot of discussion internationally uh, about these being uh, provocations or about these being demonstrations of North Korea's dissatisfaction with things that the South Koreans are doing with summit meetings uh, with other defense exercises. It would seem, given North Korea's economic position, uh, that these uh, types of demonstrations would be very costly. Is there something more going on here? Well, I think the most important thing to lay out at the bat is these are two sides that are still on a semi-permanent war footing. You know, they've been in, only in an armistice since 1953. There's never been an official peace treaty. And so, you know, they're still on a war footing. And because of that, you, you military training and training for potential scenarios of war is a fact of life consistently on both sides. So the, the, the North Koreans have been testing rockets, they've been testing uh, missiles, they've been testing artillery. Are we seeing anything new out of these tests? Yes and no. Um, these are all systems that we either suspected they had or we've known they've had for a long time. Um, but we haven't seen, uh, like for the, the Nodong missile test, the, the medium range ballistic missile, we haven't seen them test since 2009. And testing a, a platform is something you have to do if you want to make sure it's operational and if you want to make sure that it's a, a, a uh, coherent deterrent, something that actually uh, makes sense that the other side can see and knows that you have and that you know you can operate and actually use in some kind of military operation. Uh, these are taking place in North Korea around the same time that major drills are taking place in South Korea. Um, some of the largest amphibious landing exercises, for example, in, in a few decades right. uh, are now taking place between the U.S. and the South Koreans. Uh, what's the purpose of the South Korean U.S. exercises and how may those be perceived in the North? Well, first off, the Full Eagle and Key Resolve are annual military drills, and they focus on a, a staff exercise and then a military component of that staff exercise. And they're designed basically to deal with any kind of scenario where the North Korea either a, a, a pro has a provocation into South Korea, or if there's like regime collapse or the suspected use of maybe weapons of mass destruction proliferation within the country, maybe because of regime collapse. So there's an offensive and defensive component to it. Um, and then there's training for all the, the interoperability between the U.S. and Korean, South Korean forces. Uh, and, and so they can actually talk, communicate, move together, shoot together. Um, but then the other part is also a logistics component of then bringing in the reserves from the South Korean military and logistics from mainland U.S. and other uni U.S. military units in Asia, also through the region. The reason for North Korea to kind of always be upset, because every year they're upset by these drills. And one of the reasons they're upset by this is because as a, you know, trying to define something as purely offensive or defensive is very dangerous in the military world. An amphibious landing can be perceived as both. It's a capability that can be applied in many different ways. Um, we saw it applied, applied in an offensive uh, manner in a defensive situation back in 1915 in the, in the uh, Korean War when the Pusan perimeter, to break out of the Pusan perimeter, the uh, UN and uh, US forces had to do an amphibious landing in Incheon to basically flank and threaten the supply lines of the North Korean military and pull force them into retreat. But that same scenario could be applied in trying to take over portions of North Korea or try to stabilize it if there was some kind of regime change. So as we watch these, um, the, the North Koreans, for example, if they uh, launch a satellite that's perceived as, as dual use in, in North Korea, they talk about it as the legitimate right of a nation to launch a satellite. In South Korea or in, in the United Nations, they refer to it as a provocation or, or a violation of ballistic missile. In some ways, it's similar to that, not exactly. Right. I mean, if I, if I was a North Korean military planner and I see every year uh, the U.S. and South Korea doing military drills, I have to look at that and as an analyst or a military planner say, Yes, they're saying they're using it for this, but that's just what they're saying. What could they actually use it for? Because I'm in charge of defending my territory. I'm in charge of defending my country. So yes, they could be trying to deter me and keep me from invading South Korea, but at the same time, they could also use that and under any circumstances, use that to actually come into our territory. And, and I can never dismiss that. I always have to take what they're doing as a provocation to me, and therefore I have to do these kinds of tests and exercises to make sure that I'm military, you know, operational, but also to show that I have some kind of credible deterrence to them. Um, and in, in a way, it can be a provo it's perceived as pro provocation on their side. But for me, it's not a provocation, it's just common sense. The, the North Koreans have a long-standing demand that the United States pull its forces out of South Korea, right. that they allow the two Koreas to be able to uh, resolve their differences uh, on a bilateral uh, manner. Um, for a long time, the, the United States balked at that 
primarily because the South Korean military was going to be unable to defend itself against the North Koreans. What would be the balance of power on the peninsula uh, should the U.S. pull out at this point? Currently, um, the balance of power would still rely, uh, still be in South Korea's favor. They've gotten much, much better over the years because of all their work with the U.S. military. Um, I don't think they're necessarily where they want to be yet, and that we've seen that because they've kept continued to delay the actual command handover of all the Korean forces uh, out of the U.S. basically command structure, which is still it's, they're still technically under. Um, but I, the balance of forces is in the South Korean favor overall, and is going, and that trend is going is going to continue um, because of the isolation of the North Korean regime. Um, they have fewer and fewer military tools and, and monetization they have to work with, and so that balance is slowly degrading in their favor. Thank you, Paul. A and that would seem to explain a little bit why North Korea is still insistent upon maintaining a nuclear deterrent. Absolutely. For more information on this, please visit stratfor.com. And thank you for watching.